Hello all, in this lesson we're going to be studying organic reactions. I have four that we're going to focus on. There are more than four, but these four are the most important and we'll add in the other sort of less important ones over time. The bookwork I need you to do is listed here. Questions 49, 52, 53, 55, 58, and 62 on pages 208 and 209. And there is a quiz associated with this lesson, so make sure you've been studying the last few uh, lectures. Now, please follow um, that homework label with this table and draw in these structures because we're going to need them in class tomorrow. But don't fill this out. And then tag these two questions on at the end. So combustion is the first reaction that we're going to study um, in this organic reactions lesson. And it is perhaps the most common type of organic reaction. And combustion really just means to like explode or catch on fire, right? So the equation that we would use to represent that process of exploding or catching on fire would just start with a hydrocarbon, like a, in this case propane, but some number of carbons and some number of hydrogens. And it would have to be in the presence of oxygen. So in this case I have five oxygens, but it could be a different number of oxygens. And those two molecules are going to react together, usually with the, little, the help of a little bit of activation energy in the form of a spark or a match or something. And then they'll react, and they're going to make two things specifically. The first thing is carbon dioxide, and the second thing is water. So all of these little pieces are required in order for a um, combustion reaction to occur. You've got to have the hydrocarbon. You've got to have the oxygen gas. You have to produce CO2, and you have to produce water. So I want you to remember all of those things that's going to be tested. I'm starting to put in structural formulas now. That's the structural formula for propane. Here's oxygen. Here are my three CO2s. And here are my four waters. I'm only doing um, these structural formulas here because I wanted to point out that as crazy as these organic reactions may seem, they really are just rearranging the molecules. So here are my three original carbons, and here they are inside CO2s. Um, here I have eight hydrogens, and you'll find those eight hydrogens here, all inside the water molecules. Um, here are my ten oxygen atoms, and you'll find those split up between two different molecules on the right. Ten oxygen atoms here, but six oxygen atoms here, and four there. So it's all very balanced, and all the atoms are still there. they are just been rearranged into different sides. So last question is, what will be the products of any complete combustion reaction of any hydrocarbon? And of course the answers are carbon dioxide and water. Combustion. In this video you are going to learn what combustion is, the difference between complete and incomplete combustion, the products of the two types of combustion, and the effects of the products of combustion. Combustion is burning, usually in air which is all around us, or oxygen. It's an exothermic reaction, which means it gives out heat. A fuel stores potential energy that can be released as heat when we burn the fuel. An example of a fuel is natural gas or methane. This is the fuel we burn to heat up our food. Methane, like other hydrocarbon fuels such as petrol, can undergo either complete or incomplete combustion. When methane undergoes complete combustion, that is in a plentiful supply of air, it produces carbon dioxide and water, as shown by the equation, CH4 gas plus 2O2 gas gives CO2 gas plus 2H2O gas. The next reaction that you guys need to know about is substitution. A substitution reaction involves the replacement of one or more hydrogen atoms in a saturated hydrocarbon, which by the way we call alkanes. And you're replacing it with another atom or another group. Typically that other atom will be a halogen. And I think the best way to explain this is to rewrite the formula that you see below in terms of a structural formula and then we'll have something better to talk about. So starting with C2H6, 
we have that formula to start, just the two carbons. It's a saturated hydrocarbon. And then we have a Cl2 molecule, which is going to look like this. And those are the reactants, but the products include C2H5Cl, which looks like this. There's the C2H5 part of it, and here's the Cl. And then the other product is an HCl. So just like in the last reaction, we have two carbons on the left and two on the right. We have six hydrogens on the left, and we have five here, and then six on the right. And we have two chlorines on the left, and we have one, two on the right. So all that is balanced, but what I want to point out here is the substitution that occurred. So at first, we had a hydrogen atom bonded to the carbon in that position. But after the reaction occurred, we had a chlorine atom bonded in that position. So ostensibly, what has occurred is one of these chlorine atoms came over and kicked the hydrogen off of the molecule. Um, this, is, this is only able to happen because the activity of chlorine is higher than the activity of hydrogen. And only in that way is it able to achieve that substitution. So why is chlorine able to replace hydrogen on ethane? Again, it's because of activity or reactivity. Now, this is a cool question. It says, why does a hydrogen atom have to be removed? Like, why can't you just add the chlorine in without removing the hydrogen? And the reason for that has to do with saturation. So I mentioned that this molecule is saturated, which means that it has the maximum number of single bonds that it could possibly have. Um, in other words, you couldn't possibly put another single bond in there, even if it were to add a chlorine. Um, so you have to take one off before you can put one in. And in this last step, I'm going to write an equation for the reaction of methane and chlorine. I'll start by just writing methane and chlorine. So there's my methane, and there's my chlorine. And in a substitution reaction, it, oh, there's a couple of things that you have to know. Like, it can only happen on a saturated hydrocarbon, and CH4 is saturated. It has um, four bonds coming out of the carbon. Um, and in addition to that, it usually only happens with chlorine, and you can see that there's chlorine here. Um, and we just need to replace one of the hydrogens with uh, chlorine and go along our merry way. So instead of writing CH4, I'm only going to write CH3, but I will add a Cl. But that means that I have a hydrogen that is floating freely that I didn't have before, and it must be bonded to the other chlorine. So we have the CH4 and the Cl2 on the left, but on the right we have a CH3Cl, so a Cl replaced one of the Hs, and then the H and the Cl bonded on the right. So along with substitution, you have these other reactions called addition reactions. Um, addition reactions are fundamentally different than substitution because they require um, a reactant which is unsaturated meaning they have to have a reactant that has a double bond or a triple bond. So now we know that it would be impossible for a molecule such as an alkane to undergo an addition reaction, and that's because alkanes are saturated, but addition reactions require an unsaturated molecule. So I just wrote alkanes are saturated and no more atoms can be added, but an unsaturated molecule such as an alkene or an alkyne have extra room to add more atoms because they have a double bond or a triple bond, which is going to be extra space for atoms. So let's put this into practice. Let's use this alkene, which is ethene, and react it with this chlorine to show that addition is possible. So there's my structure for C2H4. It just has two carbons and four hydrogens, but if you count, all the carbons have four bonds, one, two, three, four for each carbon. And we're reacting that with a chlorine molecule. And we're expecting this to go through an addition reaction because addition reactions typically start with an unsaturated molecule like C2H4, and it involves the addition of chlorine atoms in a chlorine molecule, typically. So we're going to add both of these chlorines on. But since this carbon has four bonds and so does this carbon, I can't add these chlorines on until I break one of these double bonds. So once I break, let's say, this double bond, once I get rid of that, then each of the carbons only has three bonds, and they can each hold an extra space. So this is my C2H4 molecule after I've broken the double bond, but before I added in the extra stuff. So I'll add those two chlorines in now, 
you do need to break this bond between the two chlorine atoms, but after that is done, um, each atom will be free to make another bond. So there's one of the bonds, and here's the other one. So this is the way typically they would bond. Maybe this one would be on the opposite side like that. Um, and it is even possible for them both to be on the same carbon, although that's very unusual. You would typically see them split among the two carbons. So just to fill in the rest of the equation, um, we have the pictorial form, but this is going to be C2, H4, Cl2. And this really reinforces the concept of addition because you can see that you have these two reactants and only one product, indicating that this has just been added in. It hasn't been replacing anything. So I have to say one more thing on this slide, which is that addition reactions also can happen with um, non-chlorine elements. Now, typically we do use halogens but, uh, because they're so active. But if you use a catalyst, you can usually add other elements, even elements like hydrogen. So I'm starting out with my structure for ethene again. And this time, I'm going to do a similar process, but I'm going to add hydrogens rather than chlorines. So since hydrogen is exactly as active as these hydrogens, then the only way I can get them to add in is if I'm able to break this bond using a catalyst. Now, typically, the catalyst we'll use in this reaction is a platinum catalyst. So I'm writing PT over the arrow. But using that platinum catalyst, it lowers the activation energy enough that both of these atoms can bond to the molecule. You will have to break this bond first, so the intermediate step looks like this. And the two hydrogens would be added in in those two empty locations that just opened up. So you're going to put a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. And now we see that after reacting on a platinum catalyst, an ethene molecule and a hydrogen molecule simply make an ethane molecule. And before moving on to the next slide, I just wanted to point out that over time, our ethene became ethane. And that is something that chemists do all the time. In this tutorial, you will learn how to carry out a test to show the presence of an alkene. In our previous video on the alkanes and alkenes, we discussed how the alkenes have a carbon-carbon double covalent bond and are known as unsaturated hydrocarbons. They are unsaturated because the double bond can break and allow two new atoms to join the molecule in an addition reaction. The word unsaturated suggests the fact that an alkene molecule is not bonded to the maximum number of atoms that it could be if the double bond was to break. Alkanes, however, are saturated. There are no double bonds and so no addition reaction can take place. Therefore, no more atoms can be added to the molecule. Both the alkanes and alkenes are colourless. For example, hexane and hexene are both colourless liquids. Their displayed formula looks like this. Let us now consider bromine water. Bromine is a diatomic molecule, and when dissolved in a solvent, it forms an orange or yellowy-brown solution. Using bromine water provides us with a test for the alkenes. Look at the displayed formula below. Pause this video and take a moment to consider what reactions could happen. Since the alkene, hexene, is unsaturated, an addition reaction will occur. The double bond will break and bromine will split and the atoms added across the double bond. The product formed is called a dibromoalkane and is also colourless. Provided only a small amount of bromine water is added, all the brown bromine will react with the excess alkene to form a colourless solution. Let us try the same with the alkane. Pause the video and have a think about what reaction, if any, will occur this time. Since alkanes are already saturated, there is no room for any bromine atoms to be added to the molecule. Consequently, no reaction takes place and the solution remains brown. 
So in summary, alkenes are unsaturated. The double bond can break and new atoms can be added to the molecule. Bromine water is a brown or yellowy orange solution. When you add an alkene to bromine water, the solution goes from brown to colourless. When an alkane is added to bromine water, no reaction occurs and the solution remains brown. And our last major reaction is esterification. Esterification is a reaction between an organic acid and an alcohol. And there are a few things that always happen. The first thing is you make an ester. And secondly, you'll be producing water as well. Um, there are some interesting naming rules for these guys. To name an ester, we just draw a line down the oxygen bridge. And the half of the molecule with a double bonded oxygen receives the ending O8. The other part of the molecule has a standard alkyl name. So I just sort of uh, blanked out all the craziness at the bottom because it works best as an animation and you can't see that here. But I'm starting from scratch. So this is the acid that I'm referring to here. It is in general an organic acid because it has the C double bonded O, OH. And the real name for this is propanoic acid. We're gonna be reacting that with a particular alcohol um, which is required for these esterification reactions. So in general, it's just alcohols, but this specific alcohol has five carbons and the alcohol group is on carbon number one. So we're gonna call it one pentanol. So during this reaction, this OH and um, this OH will interact and the H here and the OH here are going to become water. So I just sort of scribbled those two guys out. But now what you're gonna see is you have this oxygen which is yearning for a new bond and we have this carbon which wants the same. So this oxygen and this carbon will join up. So they form that bond right there between the oxygen and the carbon and now we have an ester. And I say that because esters really only have a few things that they must include. They have to have an R group on the left, which in this case is these carbons right here. They need to have an R group on the right, which are these carbons. And in between the two R groups, you need to have a C double bonded O with an oxygen bridge. So I will highlight that in black now. So you need to have the C double bonded O with the oxygen bridge. You can find that here in the middle of the molecule, the C double bonded O oxygen bridge, and that's how we know it's definitely an ester. Now the name for the ester was mentioned up here. We just need to draw a little visual line for ourselves down the oxygen bridge. And this just helps us differentiate the left-hand side of the molecule from the right hand. But um, when you draw this line down the oxygen bridge, whatever side has the double bonded O, gets the, uh, forms the end of the molecule name. And that also gets the suffix O8. You can see the O8 here. Um, but, so this is gonna be propane, but it also has the double bonded O, so we're gonna change that to propan O8. And then the first part of the name is the like standard alkyl name. And you'll find that here we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So instead of um, calling that pentane, we're just gonna call it pentyl. And there's our name for the molecule. It's just gonna be pentyl propanoate. And with that, we've reached our pair up. I need you guys to copy down these questions um, to the best of your ability. You can just do, I suppose, this question, this as a question, and then we'll make both of these questions. But this is, these are just answer choices and these are just answer choices. So you don't have to copy those down. And then do copy down these summary questions. We'll answer those in class tomorrow as well. I hope you learned something and thanks for watching.